here we are, and lots of people are starting to join on quite quickly. So yeah, again, apologies for being a bit late. But my name's Kate, and I'm the director of The Big Draw, and I am super excited to have the lovely Octavia, also known as Tink, with us today. Um, I'm super proud also that Octavia is one of our uh, ambassadors at The Big Draw. Yay! So, um, yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> We've had we've got quite a few ambassadors, all from lots of different sectors. And Octavia, I think, got involved probably over a year ago, maybe a year and a half even now. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I think it was last September or last August when I did the workshop for you guys, and that oh. was the first thing that we actually worked on. So yeah, about a year. Yeah, time flies by so quickly. So, I mean, that was really how we got involved. But we were conscious that there will be people coming onto the call today. Um, that will not know what the big draw does. So just to quickly um, give people a quick update on the big draw. So we're a charity. We are a creative arts charity. We call ourselves a lot of visual literacy charity, but really it's about drawing or making marks with meaning. It's about visual communication. It's about creativity. And it's about, it's about ma making marks across the whole sector. So you could be a fine artist, you could be an illustrator, you, but you could be an engineer or a scientist or an architect all working in different ways and making marks with meaning to communicate visually. So it's really all about visual communication and creativity and education, I think, um, arts education. So we do lots of different things. We have a global uh, festival. We run a National Contemporary Art Prize and we do lots of advocacy and lobbying and events and CPD and... Lots of cool stuff. And we do lots. We do too many things, actually. <laughs> We're such a tiny little team, but... Um, we're very lucky because we have such good partners and networks and often that's how we will reach out um, overseas. So just a very quick run through of what we have, of why we're here today and what the connection is between uh, me and Octavia. Octavia, do you want to say a little bit about, a bit more about your role as an ambassador and how you got involved? Yeah, how, sure. Where, where it all started from? <laughs> oh gosh, how long have you got? Um, yeah, hi everyone, I am Octavia or Tink, if you don't know me, I'm an illustrator based in Dorset, uh, south coast of the UK, so very warm here today, as I'm sure it is wherever you guys are, um, and I first started working with Big Draw when I did a workshop for them, which was a collaboration with Adobe and Apple, which was actually I think honestly that was one of the first times in my career where I was like, oh my god, this is a really big deal like I trotted I got the train hopped on the train and trotted down to the Apple store this in Covent Garden I know <laughs> I know oh my gosh talk about feeling out of place um but yeah it's a really wonderful festival and if you know anything about my work you'll know that I'm really passionate about the fact that creativity can only have good impacts on your life no matter what form it takes for you and that's I think the reason why we connected and why the big draw means so much to me because the way I see it is all about enriching your life with creativity which is pretty much how I want to live my life so <laughs> yay yeah. um, and which is such a perfect fit which is I think why we sort of really gel very closely early on I think we've got lots of other things in common which we'll probably end up talking about a little bit more as we as we go through yeah. the next probably just about under an hour is probably what we're aiming for so so we've got loads of things that we were both hoping to cover, just making notes, but thinking about where we start and start to thread it all together, I think it would be great to hear a little bit more about, about your, where you started from really. So thinking about growing up and obviously being a very creative child, passionate about drawing, you know, making, doing art, just being creative really. And, there, and then where that went and where that developed, and obviously moving to London and what happened after that, that whole, that whole succession of events that's led you to be the impressive role model that you <laughs> are now. Um, yeah, so I have had a really roundabout route into illustration. Um, I didn't draw from the ages of, I think I was like 16 to 21 because I had a really bad art teacher who um, should not have been teaching children. <laughs> she was basically made sure that we all knew that we were rubbish at art and I was just completely put off. But as you said, I, I think I've always been creative and I did music when I was growing up um, and I ended up studying music at uni in London and I moved from Dorset and I live in the middle of nowhere 
and I went from my tiny quiet little village to London and it was fantastic and I studied music for three years and then I actually started a master's degree in journalism um, at which point my mental health became too much for me to cope with on my own and I did the completely unimaginable and moved back home to dozy little Dorset um, which is where I still live now three or four years later um, and yeah I actually picked up drawing as a form of therapy to start with and it very quickly became the only thing I wanted to spend my time on and the thing I'm the most passionate about in the world and I've been fortunate enough that I've, as I have been able to um, set off on the road to recovery from anxiety and depression I've also been able to transition into a career as an illustrator which still seems slightly ludicrous to me but <laughs> it seems to be happening so I'm just kind of rolling with the punches at this point. <laughs> so I mean is it fair to say that your yes yeah, so your progression wasn't one of the more traditional routes that many will have into you know you go and you do your fine art your foundation your fine art blah, yep. blah, you know, it wasn't that that route through was it it was a great to a great uh, extent self-taught and also oh, absolutely. Things it's... to an end you know drawing yeah. therapy drawing for as a means of coping um you keep your mind busy keep your hands busy and as a form of um of sort of self-healing in a way yeah yeah definitely i mean i am completely self-taught well myself and skillshare is basically how i <laughs> how i learned to draw it's mm. all like online classes and just figuring it out as i went along um mm. It's, it's definitely been a steep learning curve, but as I said, it's something that I, I'm i really, really passionate about. So I think it was kind of- Your passion not easy. is really what made the- it, made Yeah, it. it wasn't easy to put in the hard work because obviously it has been hard work transitioning into a completely new career, but it's been really fantastic. And mm -hmm. I still wake up every morning really excited about the things that I'm working on, which I think I, I feel very fortunate for, especially at the moment. Mm. I mean, do you think also that in, I mean, one of the things that we've noticed at the big draw certainly is that more people, not just artists, but more people generally have been turning to uh, creativity, I think, as a, as a means to help them cope with yeah. the effects of, of lockdown, really, and, yeah. and how, that, how that makes them feel. But it's just something to do. And I think you, you can see that reflected in things like the sales of hobby craft, can't you? And everyone's going out and getting crafty and, and drawing and all this yeah so what do you think of, what do you think it is about that that is encourages people to go out and have a go because all these people won't have done it before or they might be yeah. reconnected with creativity from when they've been a child i think i think there's definitely been a trend that's been growing for the last couple of years the whole sustainability thing has really helped i think because it's meant that people are more interested in making things for themselves or at least yeah. finding out how other people would make things you know um so i think that has really helped and there's definitely been a big resurgence in like art classes and ceramics and needle felting and embroidery and all sorts and it's like cool like i, fo I follow accounts that i've been following for for 10 years and they've got like half a million subscribers and they do needlepoint embroidery and i think yeah, that's so fantastic that. because yeah. what they make is beautiful but yeah. I, I think as you know i'm a litter I'm a literary sewer. Yeah. How are you doing on yeah, that scarf? It's all still going. Well, it's a coat. It's a coat. Oh, it's a coat it's now. A thick woolly coat. Yeah. yeah. I just um, I just need to finish the sleeve. So yeah, but I, I think I think that, that yes, I know what you mean. It's it, become it, more of a almost trendier. Yeah, and I think that's given people permission almost to invest their time in it because. Mm -hmm. No matter what anyone says, we're all kind of victims of peer pressure, and I think if like yeah it's just human nature really isn't it mm. so i think that's definitely helped and then obviously with lockdown and quarantine and people being on furlough or um you know having a lot more time on their hands for one reason or another mm. i think that people have been turning to places like skillshare and youtube and mm -hmm. learning new skills or at least finding new ways to pass the time um so yeah i think i think that's why it's been such mm. A big thing and it's been a real help for me as well because obviously it's <laughs> it's they been always. tough for all of us we were talking about this earlier you know the news the negative news cycle is real and i think any way that you can 
battle that and combat that and just take your mind off it even for 10 minutes is is Mm. fab no 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 absolutely for sure yeah and one of the other things that we both of us have touched on before is and and i've seen i've seen quite a few artists actually talking about it over the last few months is this i think it's particularly with i think it's particularly coming from artists who are predominantly self-taught and are in some yeah. way feeling that they're outside some sort of official or formal yeah. route <laughs> in, um, and often refer to it as um, that, that sort of vote, that that self anxiety about being somewhere, you know, perhaps going yeah. to I don't know an event where your artwork's being shown, and you know you have just as much right to be there as anybody else. But yeah. I'm going there and thinking I don't belong here, you know, in yeah. some way. It's like that imposter syndrome. Um, oh yeah. Having, I don't I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a real thing coming from taught, uh, self-taught artists. Yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, I think to some extent, because I've had anxiety for my whole life, I think no matter what I ended up doing, I would have had it to some degree. But I think that being a completely self-taught artist doesn't help. Um, yeah, it's, it's a question I get asked a lot, actually, when I talk, because I think more and more artists are being self-taught and aren't going the traditional, you know, uni's really expensive it's really expensive now and i think that people are thinking twice about going through that traditional route so yeah it's a question i get asked a lot when i do talks and honestly i don't really have a way of tackling it i've just got to the point where i kind of just sit it down and say okay great i've heard what you have to say but i'm gonna carry on regardless like up to the point that i can't so but oh my gosh i I have that every day like um Still. today Still today well. actually today I I've been working behind the scenes on a project with Adobe and the New York Times which came out today and that was a completely surreal experience like they sent a photographer this is all in lockdown I had a socially distanced photo shoot with the New York Times oh. Yeah, well, I, think, I can imagine that everybody would find that a little bit stressful and, you know? and honestly it's every time I email them I'm like at some there's just that little voice it's like at some point they're going to realize who they're talking to and they're going to be they're like gonna find oh, you out. yeah they're going to find <laughs> you out. yeah yeah which yeah. is hilarious and you and touched on you touched on adobe so for for the people who are, have have joined us and obviously we will it, it's 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 obviously recording so we will share it afterwards we'll also share a number of other platforms as well um you do have a very strong association with adobe and there's a fantastic program, isn't there, that Adobe run, the Creative Residency Program, which yes. is a really excellent platform for those individuals that are able to bag themselves a place on that. And so if I remember, you were the Cre- Adobe Creative Resident for the UK up until April for that year. Yeah. Up until, and then obviously there's a new cycle, but they still, it's like an alumni, isn't it? So you carry on, it's a nurturing thing. It's very much a sort of yeah. alumni. Yeah, it's we like i still talk to some of the past residents and i have been fortunate to carry on working with adobe in lots of different ways since i left the residency um but before i move on i just also wanted to say that yes so the creative residency program is a year-long thing and you apply and they fund a year's worth of work on your passion project which was incredible but um in response to the pandemic and everything they actually also have started the creative residency fund which is a one million us dollar yeah. fund for creatives so if you're watching this i would really encourage you to google it and apply because um they're basically handing out grants um and commissioning people to work on your passion projects so if you have found yourself at a loose end or you want to make a change then please go and check that out because it's a really amazing opportunity and you've got to be in it to win it if you don't apply you won't get Absolutely. it <laughs> One thing I just wanted to pick back up, what I was going to say about the whole sort of self self taught route is I often I often wonder and think that actually that, I mean those artists that are coming in from a self taught route there's a sort of um, I don't know it's almost sort of Vena. I mean it, it feels a bit like if you go down the traditional route there's certain certain artists you have to look at certain constructs they expect you to think about certain and I often wonder whether that's just too it's molding somebody to think in a certain way and go down a certain yeah. path. And there's also, there's all, you know, there's almost a train of thought things. Well, somebody that is, has talent, that's ambitious, that's creative, that likes to play around with ideas. And they're not in that. Maybe that their ideas are going to be far more original actually. 
for yeah, nothing well, I think, in all of that. And I do often wonder that. I kind of fell into my style very early on. I mean, probably within the first six months of drawing, I had a distinct style and I, I knew what that was. And it's that whole thing of like Picasso, I think, said that you have to learn how to draw properly. Like, basically, you have to learn the rules so you know how to break them. And he, like, I've seen sketches and paintings of his where he's drawn like true to life, Ooh. and they're amazing. And then you look at the stuff that he did when he kind of allowed his creativity to take over, I guess, and it's the complete opposite of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, and I do definitely think that in some ways not learning how to draw a hundred percent properly it did lead me to like my creative identity quicker and I'm not saying that that's better I did, like there are <laughs> multiple times a day where I wish that I did have that really solid foundation of being able to draw anything and have it look exactly like that but I think to me that's kind of the beauty of illustration is being able to put your perspective on things and try and get the feeling of something across instead of actually what it actually looks like in a photo yeah. and you do have a you do have a very distinctive style don't you um because i will <laughs> often see things I, will, I think we were on um print social i think it was print social website i think it might have been oh, yeah. the other week and maybe it was that i can't remember anyway and we were all a bit like that looks like one of octavia <laughs> yeah it's just it so before. it's so distinctive which is fantastic Thank you. That's you know. nice to hear. <laughs> oh, I think it is. I think it's got a real distinctive feel to it. Um, so just treading back a bit, one of the things that you've touched on a little bit was obviously going back. So it's going back to this idea, and it, you know, it's nothing new to the art sector, this idea of um, art for well-being, creativity for our well-being and, and our balance and all the rest of it. And you yourself, so you were touching a little bit on your own health earlier. And, you know, for anybody who's on the call, I mean, they, the third, they will know, I'm sure, know you and know that you are an incredible champion and advocate for mental health. And that you have been quite outsp outspoken and shared your experiences very openly. And hopefully, you know, there's people here or when we come to share this um, on YouTube or when it goes on to the Instagram uh, TV thing after this, that there might be people that might sort of take some, glean some inspiration, some hope from that. Because there are, there is always a way through, I think. Um, I wonder yeah. if you want to just, just say any more on that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough talking about it, I'm not going to lie. But it gets easier every time you do it. It, it really does. It, I think it's, in, in some ways, it's like learning a new language. And the first time I spoke about it, it felt completely alien and wrong and like, everyone was gonna scream at me to shut up and go and sit in the corner but um it really did get easier every time I did it um but I do also think because I basically had a nervous breakdown and I think that the reason I'm part of the reason I'm able to talk about it so openly is because I was completely broken as a person like I wasn't functioning as a human being and I think it became necessary for me to be completely blunt like I've spoken so many times before about the poor people I would meet walking up the high street in my local town and they'd be like, oh, hi, how are you? And I completely lost the ability to be like, I'm fine. And I was like, oh, we all do that a bit too terrible. much. It's like Everything's it's terrible. Which you know. obviously was, you know, it took, took people some time to get used to, I think. But I don't think I've ever had a negative reaction to being honest about what I was actually going through, which definitely spurred me on. And then... When I did get to the point where I was recovered enough to actually start working again, um, I kind of fell into public speaking. And as I said earlier, I'm really passionate about using creativity to better your life, even if it's not anything to do with mental health. I think it um, has many far reaching positive uh, benefits for life in general. But um, so it felt very natural when I started talking to talk about creativity and mental health and kind of the overlap and how they feed into each other and bounce off each other. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I have obviously, I've got a lot of empathy with that. And I think that those, I think that all of the things that you you know, you're having to do on a daily basis as well to manage it as well yeah. and, and maintain that, that feeling of doing some something creative every day that helps combat yeah. some of those challenges, I think is, is, is really important. Um, 
I mean, for yeah. the people who are on the call, I mean, uh, Octavia knows very well that I also have um, some mental health issues. I have, um, I have quite severe OCD unless I don't take my medication. <laughs> um, I'm on my drugs most of the time, so I'm okay. But um, I say I'm okay, but like Octavia, I have to manage it very carefully. And yeah. Certain stresses, tiredness, anxieties, there's always certain triggers, and I have to be quite yeah. careful around all of those things. And I think certainly there are times, aren't there, where those things are enhanced massively and you, you, you cope with them but nobody would know it's all it's all internalized and you sort of people on the surface just think it's all just oh it's all fine it's all fine and it's yeah. all just like wearing away behind i mean i found i found lockdown challenging um certainly from an ocd point of view particularly yeah. because mine's for security so i found that yeah. it's ramped up for me massively particularly in relation to my children so i've you know gone suddenly you know Lots of old stuff resurfacing around anxieties around other children say, yeah. I'll be okay, I'll be breathing, do I need to wake them up again just to make sure they're breathing? You know, all that, all that sort of stuff that I'd really put a lid on a few years ago. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, I, it is difficult. I've definitely had the same thing, and I think a lot of people have, like being in a confined environment for that long and having like real, real world disaster type stuff happening and mm. you know having something to actually worry about it's been really odd because normally with my anxiety I can recognize where it's not actually true to life but when you're facing a global health crisis political yeah. crisis yeah. economic crisis it's yeah. really hard to actually sit yourself down and be like oh don't worry about it none of that's going to happen because it's happening in the yeah. world yeah. and I think that's why um, so I actually recently started a 365 day drawing project at the start of July because I definitely found myself spiraling and I fell into the trap of like checking the news all the time and being on social media but not like achieving anything just scrolling endlessly and it's yeah I think it's I think that's definitely my my baseline and that's what I fall back into so is yeah I've but you recognize that you recognize and, think, and you go and you yeah. take the steps that you need to do the creative steps for you yeah to start to pull that back in and get and yourself I think self -knowledge, on honestly self-knowledge is probably the biggest tool I now have in my arsenal because it's like you were saying earlier you know I can pretty much predict if I'm going to be tired or if I'm going to be doing more work than normal I'm going to be stressed I'm going my mental health is going to suffer and I think that, you know, having that knowledge and knowing, you can basically predict it, which is power really, because then it's like, okay, so I'm going to go to bed at 6 p.m. because that's what I need to do to get through it. So, yeah, yeah I think- And avoid those triggers, moment, absolutely. No matter what situation you're in, whether you have mental health problems or if you're just feeling the pressures of life, just make sure that you're checking in with yourself and doing everything you can to look after yourself, like getting enough yeah. sleep and, eating regularly and talking to people that make you feel grounded and calm so yeah but I, I mean environment's important isn't it as well because you, you you mentioned earlier around you know you were living in London you felt unwell you went back home um yeah and it it sounds very idyllic you said you know by your own admission it's quite quiet yeah. you know you might call yeah. it sleepy even but yeah. it's obviously helped you and it helped and also it's very creative for you so I was I was really yeah. interested because I think that our home life, our family backgrounds do play a role in our creativity. And, and I, you've got your you know, creative family upbringing as well, interested in art and culture, aren't they? But also linking it back to the theme as well and sustainability. And also I know that your, you know, your business, your, your whole business is, is also sustainable. So in terms of the materials that you use and how you live your life at home and how you connect with nature and how that, that's all part and parcel of feeling healthy and in balance with, the things around you and with nature yeah so I, I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit more about that yeah of course and I mean that for me directly feeds in the self-knowledge thing like when I was living in London I was working all the time I was going out all the time with my friends I basically wasn't stopping because I was having a mental health crisis and anytime I stopped I felt rubbish so I just pushed through and kept home. going <laughs> um which did not work out would not recommend it um and I honestly, I never, I never thought I'd move back to Dorset. I never thought I'd move back to a sleepy village where 
we have one shop and it's shut on Wednesday afternoon because they do a stock take. It's like, it's tiny. It's probably the size of two double beds and they shut on Wednesday afternoons to do a stock take. It's, it's fabulous. It's quite lovely, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh I live yeah. in a house with a roof made of straw and all I can see out my back window is fields mm. and the only sounds I can really hear on the road is the occasional horse walking past. It's it's ridiculous and I honestly don't think I would ever go back to living in a city because I get so much out of living here and yeah sustainability definitely comes from that. And we i mean we have compost heaps in the garden so i've grown up with that and we have like apple trees in the orchard and a small vegetable patch and um we also have like our milk delivered in glass bottles on the doorstep every other day which is such a villagey thing but i love it um so i think it was just kind of natural for me when i set up my business to try and be as sustainable as possible um so yeah, my Etsy shop, all my packaging is plastic free, which is something I'm really proud of. And it has been a real effort, honestly. It's so easy to, and it's so cheap to just buy plastic packaging. It protects things better. You know, it was invented because it's really good at the job that it does. It just is so good at it that it never goes away. Um, so I package everything in cardboard and paper and, um, yeah, I try and use UK-based suppliers or Europe-based yeah. suppliers um, wherever possible, pretty much all the time, actually. Um, and it's also, especially at the moment, it's really important to me to be able to support local businesses. Like, I recently moved to a printer in Bristol, which is about an hour and a half away from me, which means that, yes, I'm supporting a local business, but it also means, like, the carbon emissions are lower. Yeah. To, to it's, a get whole, it's a whole cycle is it the whole chain yeah and etsy actually are really yeah. great with that because etsy offset the carbon emissions of every delivery that you send out they do it for you so um yeah but so i think i think you know people buying consumers are becoming so much uh, more choosy now and i think all of these yeah. things that you're doing um will make it more attractive i mean you know, it, you know the, the work's beautiful and i mean as you know from my children earlier you know the, the, the boxes <laughs> that you do i know but everyone on the call, my girls are big fans of Octavia's work, but some of the lovely hug packages and things. I mean, they're very beautiful, but I think it, there's something nice, isn't there, as you're opening, if you know that it's all biodegradable. Well, and that's, that's the tricky before. thing. That's the tricky thing is it's really important to me that it's sustainable, but it's equally important to me that, A, it represents my brand, but also that it's beautiful for people to open. So, yeah, it's it's definitely been a long road. And when I first set up my shop, I was not, sustainable um so it's been a process but i yeah. i feel comfortable with where i am with it now yeah so if we move on if we maybe move on a bit to talk about where you are now in your current practice so your work's very joyful vibrant um hopeful but does also explore some of these more challenging themes that we've both touched on you know you've, you've done that regularly in your work how would you i mean how would you describe your work i know it's really hard as an as a individual to describe yeah. your it's really hard I know but I mean yeah. how would you describe it if someone hadn't seen the work you know in terms of I suppose mediums material approach is there how do you what would you just well, where um, would you start well I definitely I think joy is a word that I use all the time because I get so much joy from my work and that's definitely something that I aim to pass on to other people that might see it as well but I think more more than anything um i don't know i i tend to say it's like a blend of escapism and realism because i'm either drawing like fantastical landscapes that don't exist in strange colors i love using bright colors or i'm illustrating things that are bothering me at the moment like um i i do a lot of work around mental health as we've talked about um and i like to say that i try and illustrate the human experience or at least what it looks like from my perspective um mm. i think especially when i started out like when i first set up my instagram it wasn't because i wanted to try and have a business or a career it was very much okay i have depression and anxiety i can't work i don't have any friends i need a way to talk to people and i'm drawing so it was very much just like okay i'm going to put my stuff out on the internet and see what happens yeah 
Which but, I think I think is incredibly frightening for everybody yeah, to yeah. do. I mean, you know, yeah. even the bravest person is putting yourself out there. There's going to be some fear. I mean, one of the things that I'm I'm not very good. I'm trying, if there's any questions or anything, I'll try and pick some of them up. But I'm, a few of the comments you just you just get tons of hearts all the time, Octavia, coming up the screen. But you know, things like you can feel the joy in the work as one of the comments. But I think you really can. You really can. And I mean, one of the things I always like when I see it um, is some of the figures. I always think, yeah, proper women. Proper, there's proper women in these. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, mean? I, it's I just, do, and, and it's, I really like that. I I think that you know it's it is really important to me to to get across to people what my life looks like, and I might do that in a neon color palette. But if I'm really struggling with self doubt or anxiety or feeling like I'm not good enough, then I definitely. Um, that's what I'm going to be drawing because as I said earlier, I feel like I don't have any filter anymore when it comes to my feelings. Like if I'm feeling something, I'm going to express it, whether that's talking to someone or drawing or it. Or through, <laughs> through your artwork. Yeah. 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 I mean, and your, I mean, your color palettes are always very distinctive as well. I think, um, I mean, do you have particular palettes that you go to that tend to come through um, the, the different strands of your work? At the moment, I'm really obsessed with, bright pink bright orange and pale purple <laughs> no, i've really noticed orange recently yeah. yeah orange has been a real i knew about the pink anyway um, but the yeah. orange yeah <laughs> but honestly really? sometimes i'll i'll start drawing and i won't know what colors to use and i will challenge myself to use every color <laughs> in roji <Okay>. bib <laughs> so um yeah. yeah using color is is really important to me and it's really for me it's, it's a simple way to inject some fun into my work and it really does bring me joy. So, yeah. I think colour is so important. I mean, I love colour as well. I mean, I love colour on me, around me, in my clothes, in my, you know, yeah. people. It, I think, I think we all respond to colour, don't we? And yeah, and how it, your how you're feeling or your mood or anything. I think it's so it's and, so important. And also, I definitely have quite like a naive style, um, and that's quite intentional because. I do talk about quite serious things sometimes and I think it's easier for people to swallow and it's easier for me to swallow if it's packaged up in a rainbow polka dot jumper, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I think, it, I I think, think that's right. I mean, depending on the client, I suppose if you're working on some quite, you know, really quite challenging, serious mental health message and you want people to read this, if it looks yeah. really like, whoa, and they're feeling bad enough, well, they probably won't read it because it's just going to bring them down even more. Yeah. You know? So you want to at least get them to a point where they feel able to actually digest the information. I think it's, it's For very similar to, It's a real challenge. It's, it's very similar to what I was saying earlier about sustainability and how it's really important to me to be sustainable, but also have the packaging be beautiful. I think it's the same with my work in that I do want to talk about mental health, but I also want to make it look beautiful. So, which is sounds a bit odd, but I try and try and do it. <laughs> so, we've got a question: Do you use traditional paper and pencil to do your initial designs, or do you play around on the digital platforms straight away? So, I suppose again, this has come up quite a lot over the last uh, Instagrams that we're doing this whole this whole thing between analog and digital artists are doing. Yeah. So many people now are, are sort of flip flopping between the two quite seamlessly, yeah. or using elements in different ways. So where yeah. do you start and where do you stand on that? Um, I'm definitely a flip-flopper. I go between, for finished pieces, I go between full-on paintings. I love, I'm love. i really loving using acrylic gouache and gouache paints at the moment. Yeah. And I normally do coloured pencil details on the top or um, I draw an Adobe fresco. Most of my client work is digital because it's easier. <laughs> if they don't like something, I yeah. can delete that layer and start again instead of having to redraw the whole thing. But in terms of starting ideas, I actually, I have this little sketchbook, which is more of a notebook, honestly, and it's just, I use it for like visual note taking, and I just ah. have a really pencil or a pen, yeah. because I don't want to be able to rub it out, because it doesn't matter, like I never share this with anyone, but if I have a thought, this is where it goes, and then yeah. I'll go on to develop it, whether it goes on to be a digital or um, yeah. old school, traditional piece but and again it's really interesting but sketchbooks is such a common thread through and um, everything and you know with engineers yeah. and scientists everyone's keeping they might call it a log book but it's the same thing really well you know, I, it's their ideas it's capturing notes and ideas visually in different ways 
Yeah, I'm a complete stationary nerd as well, so <laughs> I get a real sense of satisfaction around finding. I actually found, you can tell I'm sat at my desk, can't you? I found this one recently, which I'm obsessed with. It's like really landscape, and I hadn't seen one like that before, so yeah. I, I love finishing a sketchbook because it means I get to buy a new one, but I've definitely had to... I have to restrict myself and I can't buy a new do you one. Have to have to ration your one. Yeah. purchases. Because I yeah. would just go insane, honestly. <laughs> I can't stop myself. <laughs> yeah, but I think that people will feel like that about your products, you know, that they are incredibly beautiful. Um, you know, so we got, yeah, so you, you, you got your stuff up online. So you mentioned Etsy. You've also been doing quite a lot of other things. You've been very busy. Yes. Busy be in lockdown in terms of YouTube and, and I always yeah. say it wrong. Not, it's pa Patreon. 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 Yeah. Patreon. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, maybe tell everyone a little bit more about, about that because that's all looking rather lovely as well. Online. So YouTube is very definitely something that I started because of lockdown. Um, I found myself with more free time on my hands and I'd always been really daunted by the idea of like video editing but um, I've started putting out weekly studio vlogs on my YouTube channel which um, the links in my bio of my Instagram um, and I really love it I'm, I'm really enjoying it actually and I think in a weird way because the other question I get all the time is what do you do outside of illustration and the answer is not much I don't really have I'm sure you're quite busy I mean I, well I am I am but my point is I don't really have a hobby so yeah. in a weird way YouTube and video editing for me has become a hobby because it's work so I can kind of quiet that voice that's like you need to be working or you're not doing enough but it's really fun and satisfying and yeah so I'm really enjoying doing YouTube and it also makes me think about how I'm doing things because in order to be able to explain them to other people I need to actually understand what I'm doing instead of being on autopilot all the time and <laughs> um, so that's been really fun and then I also set up a Patreon page yeah which is basically um, you can subscribe for exclusive um, goodies um, ranging from updates on behind the scenes projects I'm working on to digital downloads to physical postcards and stickers that I post out every month. Um, it's been so wonderful and I am a little bit speechless that people would um, support my work <laughs> which like that which is crazy to me but um, so so grateful to my patrons and it's yeah it's it's really fab and and also I'm hoping in the long run it will enable me to have the time to actually do more painting because as I said all my work client work at the moment is digital yeah. but painting is more like therapy to me so being able to do more of that is is great and, that and that's balance, exactly, it? yeah it's exactly what YouTube and, and Patreon are allowing me yeah. to do at the moment more painting so yeah yeah. There's a question on there, which I think we were touching on earlier about nature. So, um, so coming from a wrong environment, do you find inspiration spending time in nature? Yes, I absolutely do. I'm very, very inspired by plants, as you can probably see. <laughs> You've got a lovely um, backdrop there. Yeah, I have a lot of house plants, and then we also have um, a large garden here at home. Um, last week on my studio vlog, actually, I went and sat in the garden and painted my garden. So if you fancy watching that, you can see the whole process on my YouTube. Um, but 100%, I, I think near enough every illustration I do either has people or plants in it. That's kind of my go-to. There definitely is. I've noticed that there's always a lot of um, botanical foliage. Plant. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Just so, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of the things as well that maybe thread out a little bit more. I, I love the fact that, you know, you, you talked about some of your challenges and anxieties and that. And, and then, but what, we, what you have now, you have evolved into something of a regular public speaker, haven't you? So, I know. It, I know. <laughs> there is a little bit of a fire in you now. Um, you know, yeah. and you do find yourself regularly at big things, talking to lots of people. Um, yeah. I mean, what would you say to... What would you say to other people who have uh, maybe felt anxious or, or maybe they're fine, but the thought of doing public speaking, because a lot of people have got an issue about public speaking. It's very yeah. common. What would you say to them? Because you've made this amazing transition. Yeah, I mean, honestly, 
again, it's just a case of the more you do it, the easier it gets. And I still have at least 10 minutes before every talk where I'm just thinking, why do I keep doing this to myself? <laughs> but then I stop and I do, and I do actually really enjoy it. And I get a huge sense of satisfaction from talking to people about mental health and creativity. And without fail, every time I open up, I get people coming up to me afterwards um, telling me about their experiences, which is so, so special to me. I had, I spoke at Adobe Max in LA last year um, and I had people coming up to me afterwards and crying and telling me about how really? they'd had mental health issues for decades and they'd never spoken to anyone about it and that like coming from the place that I come to that will always mean absolutely everything to me um oh. so I definitely get spurred on by people it's the response also that other people get isn't it yeah I mean, it, 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 if it helps yeah. somebody else yeah it's but my, I, guess, that it's, I guess my it's advice possible. if you want to start but you're terrified is this is the best time because no actual conferences are happening they're all online and digital so i i guess a baby step would be to yeah. do a digital one from the comfort of your own home and you won't have an audience or anything so um yeah, yeah i think that's a really good idea actually yeah if if somebody wanted to sort of put their toe into the water they could do that because as you say that it's a wash isn't it the internet's a wash with yeah those. well i actually i spoke at 99u this year but it was a virtual conference so which is like sad because i was meant to be going to new york to do it <laughs> but it was also good because my the introverted me was really happy that i could do the talk literally in my house and go downstairs and have a cup of tea afterwards <laughs> you know yeah. it's so there's yeah there's good things and bad things i guess yeah and you do have lots of other so you, you know we've talked about your your public speaking and all the work that you've your ongoing work with adobe but you do have a number of other um i know so you, you talked about your youtube you talked about your etsy and your patreon 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 I keep yeah. saying um <laughs> but you do have a number of other big things in the pipeline i do i do i have literally what day what day of the week are we on we're on wednesday it <laughs> is wednesday i actually had to check on my phone yeah i never really so bad. um last friday i sent off the final files for my first book which is so exciting i have done numerous happy dances i am i'm so excited um so i actually illustrated and um, I was going to say an autobiography, a biography of John Lennon for the Little People Big Dream series, which was such a dream come true. I mean, I've been a complete book nerd since the age of five when I read the first Harry Potter. I have always been such a keen reader. So even before I wanted to be an illustrator, having a book published was like a dream for me. So um, can't believe that that's happening. It's out in November. Um, and it's actually at the printers right now. I'm going to get a proof this week, like a physical so proof. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and as Octavian knows, my kids love those books. And yeah. we're very excited earlier to hear about all of this. So, yeah. um, and so actually, if anybody's I'm interested, is, it a, is there pre-ordering? Do they go on to, where do they? Yes, you, you, can actually, you can actually pre-order it on Amazon, which yeah. is also ludicrous to me. <laughs> Yeah, if you just search John Lennon, Little People, Big Dreams, it will it will come up as like the first, the first one, and it yeah you can pre-order it now and it comes out in November, which is very odd exciting. and exciting. Very exciting, and then it will be and then it will be your autobiography next after that. Well, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Well, when you're like globally famous, Octavia, remember us at the big draw. Oh. So we can like scurry stick. behind on your coattails, going, oh, we're here, we're here, we know her. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you your first big train. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what have we, what have we missed? Let me have a look at my notes. Um, I think we've covered most of the things. I mean, I suppose the other thing I was, I was thinking that people might, it was maybe more a bit more about about tips for people so maybe if people are wanting either whether they're starting out or they they yeah. are already established in some way but they want to maybe break through in some way i mean i know that obviously it helps with you with the residency but you were already doing lots yeah. of other things as well yeah yeah 
Um, I mean, I guess I would say two things. The first is whether it's illustration or anything else, make sure you're doing it every day. Um, even if no one is hiring you to do it, you need to hire yourself, like give yourself little briefs or think about what your dream projects would be and actually draw that book cover that you'd love to do because it's such a, ca a case of people hire you for the work that you've done, which is just the way it works. It's a shame, but it's the way it works. So if you have a portfolio page and you've got all these amazing book covers, then people looking for book cover artists will be more likely to hire you. Like, I'm not saying just for book covers, it applies to literally any situation. Um, yeah. And the other thing I would say is make sure you tell people what you're actually doing. <laughs> and this was really <laughs> hard for me at the start, but um, I watch Frown Nerd on YouTube and many of the people watching will know of her through Instagram or YouTube. She's like the biggest illustration video content creator and she's fab. But she actually said, um, she had like a full video of tips of people starting out. And she said, make sure you email everyone and say that you're actually an illustrator and you're open for business and you want to do work for people. Um, and I didn't actually send an email to everyone I know, but having that mindset of, I think it's really easy because we are in our own heads a lot of the time, especially as freelancers, it's easy to think that the world knows exactly what you're doing and what you're working on and the kind of yeah. things that you're capable of. But the truth is that they don't and you really have to spell it out for them. Um, yeah, so hire yourself yeah. and make, make the things that you want other people to actually pay you to make. <laughs> And all the digital platforms that you've been talking about, would you recommend those platforms for people who are really wanting to get themselves out there and promote their their work? And yeah, their it's Instagram sales, for me, basically, as well. Yeah, Instagram for me has definitely been the big one. Um, and Pinterest as well, which I don't think gets enough credit, but Pinterest basically works like a search engine. So I think if, if someone searches for feminist illustration, my work's on, like, the second page, which yeah. is ridiculous um but in terms of social media definitely instagram i've tried out twitter i i just don't enjoy it i don't enjoy twitter and i'm sorry twitter it's it's not going to work out between us um, you're mainly instagram is your main yeah yeah instagram and youtube very visual. At the moment yeah and the other thing that I made a note from, and it's going right back to the beginning, I'm just mindful of the time, we've still got a few minutes to go, was going right back to the very beginning when you were talking about um, when you were at school, you did, you touched on te the teachers. And obviously at the Big Draw, we work a lot with schools and arts organisations. And as we know, I mean, I, I won't go and slip into like getting on my soapbox because then I'll start ranting about the whole <laughs> state of the arts education, the education, blah, blah, blah. So we won't yeah. do that. But one of the things again that we hear a lot is i think the importance of having strong role model teachers as well um so it, you often hear the it, it's that whole you know i had this great art teacher at school and they really helped me you know they inspired me they supported me they spoke up for me when nobody else was speaking up for me or yeah. the opposite yeah and i just wondered if you wanted to say a bit more about that because lots of young people will, will get to their you know to make their gcse choices and they will be often sadly influence to take choices they don't necessarily really want to take because yeah. there's a, a perception or an incorrect perception that maybe certain you know the, the lack of parity between the different subjects and yeah. they get maybe pushed down the, the, the route that's not quite right for them unfortunately we hear it we hear i mean i hear it to be honest, i hear it nearly every day but yeah. I, I did wonder a, a little bit more if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that experience you thought that was yeah um i mean she was basically someone that shouldn't have been teaching and it was very much like a fear culture um i mean i did art for gcsc and i remember needing some paper so that i could do my coursework and all the paper was stored in a big cupboard next to her desk and we would have to wait until she left her office at like 7 p.m and i went to boarding school i hasten to add we'd wait until she left at like 7 p.m and then sneak down to the art block just so we could get paper out to do our work it was that kind of it was not good um so it's no, not really a surprise that i left it for so long but not um, you weren't encouraged no. but i think you know the facts of life are that sometimes people need to have like a better a better looking university application and i think that starts long before gcse sadly nowadays but 
if it's something you're passionate about just make sure that you're doing it in after school clubs or your own free time or breaks or whenever you have the chance it I think it so much of it is about carving out five minute sessions even if it's once a week and trying to squeeze as much into them as possible yeah I think the thing that we've talked about before at different sessions or maybe it was at the um maybe it's in Manchester last year but this idea about there's no such thing as a perfect drawing or there's no such yeah. thing as the perfect end product and that sometimes yeah. you just have to stop and just maybe actually maybe even yeah. force yourself to share it publicly and then just live with the horribleness yeah. of that and see what comes back yeah, yeah. probably be loads of nice things anyway but it's just getting over that 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 sense that Definitely. there is a, a right and a wrong them. way of doing it i mean i i actually spoke about this on my last youtube as well finishing this book I easily could have spent another six months on it I think you know it's like it's finished and I'm proud of it but there's more I could do because there's always more you can do and I think yeah sometimes you just have to yeah. close the book and call it a day um there was just one more question there was uh, wasn't there? there was one about self-care yes yeah, yeah so the, I've got it so how do you manage to keep on top of your sort of self-care routine when basically you are juggling so many work yeah. related projects um yes very good question i think the answer is i had to learn the hard way that if i don't look after myself i pay the price and then i end up being unable to work anyway so it, like it doesn't it doesn't work you always pay a price for it i think or at least i do um so yeah but generally i <laughs> i have a bit of an old lady routine i go to bed really early every every day I love it. I used to be a complete night owl, but I would so much rather go to bed early and wake up at the crack of dawn. Um, and I think I don't really have a self-care routine because I would say it adapts depending on my mood and, and my workload and kind of what I'm dealing with at that particular time. But I think as a general rule, I just know enough about myself that if I'm feeling tired, I know I need to do less because otherwise I will feel worse, you know, so tiredness yeah. is such a big one isn't it yeah tiredness is a massive one Low tiredness. And, and i just feel really lucky that i have a job where if i wake up and i feel exhausted or like i need to take a break i can take the morning off because the only person i have to answer to is myself which is very empowering yes yeah and i think maybe we need to start to wrap it but on that note in terms of empowering, yes. in terms of just rounding off last words um for those, maybe those young women who might watch this as we save it in terms of empowering the next generation, not just women, men as well, but you know, women more, <laughs> no, everybody, what would you say? What would be your, your tips around everything, around your practice, about, about your health? I mean, do you have anything sort of you want to bring it all together? As to oh round I think we've got I maybe mean, a couple of minutes left. Yeah, I think the biggest message that I've learned. I, mean, I, I, I think you're hugely inspirational. I think that there be, you know, once we share this, lots of people will watch it, once we, we share it more widely as well, that there'll be lots of lots of people, and I think lots of kids out there as well, that might be hearing some of the things that you're talking about and thinking, yeah, I can really identify with that. Maybe I can do this. And I think that that's incredibly yeah. pow powerful. Thank you. I mean, much I needed. it's hard to squeeze it into a 30-second sentence, but I guess I think the most important lesson for me that I've definitely learned the hard way is make sure you're actually taking time to sit down and listen to yourself like what what do you want to do and what do you need to do at the moment and I think that applies to self-care it applies to career choices life choices I think it's very easy to get swept up in what we see as society's expectations for our life and that's something that I've had to deal with like I I crashed and burned out of a degree with a nervous breakdown so I had a lot of guilt for a really long time over feeling like I'd failed because I hadn't completed that. But yeah, I think it's all about learning who you actually are instead of pandering to who you think society wants you to be because that doesn't actually exist and you'll be happier for it. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I can top that. I mean, I don't think <laughs> anything I can say that's gonna come close to that. So on those incredibly um uh, inspirational words <laughs> shall we wrap it up and i would say that we can do another one if people would like us to and if octavia is up for it 
Yeah, anytime. Yeah. It's great to be able to chat to you. Because we could chat all day, could we? <laughs> we could. We could talk for yeah, We could just carry, yeah. carry it all day. We could be, I could go downstairs, I could get the gin out, you know, yeah. and I could just gradually sink yeah. into it. I can go for hours with it. Yeah. Um, but I always <laughs> love talking to you, Octavia. You know I do. Like and fun. I, you know, we're, I mean, we're at the Big Draw, we're incredibly proud of you, of what you've done and what you've achieved. And yeah looking forward Thanks. to doing much much more and much more collaboration with you and watch this space mm -hmm. and obviously keep us posted as you know more as the details on the book come out so we can help share that yes definitely. and telling people as well where to go so you've got a yeah. website haven't you i think people yes. are following already on instagram that will take you through to all of your links yeah uh, so on instagram i'm at tink outside the box um or you can head to tink outside the box.com um and you should be able to hopefully find anything else from there yeah and anybody who wants to get in touch with The Big Draw, you can contact us through, well, through me or through Instagram account or just put The Big Draw in and we'll, we'll pop up all over the place. So, yeah. Thank you so much, lovely. Always thank you. And thanks to you. for watching as well. It was so nice yes, to Yes, thank you to everyone. We will share. We will share more widely. And join yep. us again. Great. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, lovely. See you later. Bye. Bye.